I heard about this uh, man who was walking on the beach and God said to him, Son, you've been so faithful and I want to grant you one special wish. The man got excited and he said, God, I've been dreaming about going to Hawaii, but I'm afraid to fly. So, can you please build me a bridge across the ocean? And God said, Son, that's too unreal, unrealistic. That's totally impossible. Just imagine the logistics of doing it. So, why don't you wish again? Then, the man said, okay, God, I've been married four times and all my ex-wives told me that I've been so insensitive to all of them. And so this is my wish, God. I wish that I will be able to understand the woman and I want to know why they think like they think and feel like they feel. Then there was a long pause. Then God said, Son, can we talk about that bridge that you wanted to that you mentioned earlier? You want two lanes, four lanes. Okay. Hallelujah. Okay, today we're gonna we're gonna talk about finding strength in adversity. Welcome everyone and to all our Facebook uh, viewers. It's a joy to come into your homes. If you are in the area in Ontario, feel free to visit us and we'll make you feel like you're just home, okay? All right, let's go. Let's dive to the Word. John 16, verse 33. How many of you here likes tribulations, trials, problems? Anyone? Okay, nobody. I don't like it either. Why? Because we know that uh, problems, these trials, they uh, make us uh, down, unhappy, sad, miserable, and uncomfortable. Sometimes we feel so uh, insecure and depressed. And some other people would be thinking of committing suicide because of the uh, bigness of the of the problem that's why uh, all of us we don't like it and uh, but the bible says that everyone will be facing tribulations in fact jesus himself said in john 16:33 Let's read that. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Have, I have overcome the world. Yes, whether you are a believer or an unbeliever, we will all face tribulations, whether we like it or not. And I'm sure you, you all know that it's not easy. It's downright difficult. But we have to understand the tough times of life cost, cause us to grow. And that's when our faith is stretched. That's when God is doing a work in us. It may be uncomfortable. We may not like it. But if we can keep the right attitude, God has promised to use that difficulty for our good, for our advantage. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. So when we are facing difficulties, instead of whining, instead of complaining, we can say, God, you know, sometimes we say, God, why am I in this situation? 
Why do I have to work with these people that I don't like? Sorry. <laughs> Our attitude should be, God, I know you are in complete control of my life. So I'm going to stay filled with faith, knowing that you will use these difficulties to my advantage. I know that you will turn it around for my good. Our faith is similar to a, uh, to a muscle. It grows stronger through resistance. When it is exercised, when it is being stretched, when it is being pushed. And that's why God does not usually deliver us overnight from adversities. He doesn't remove us from every uncomfortable situation in a split second. And he uses those times to build our spiritual muscles. Or perhaps God may want to see us how we treat other people when they are not treating us well. He may want to see us how we are going to respond or what kind of attitude we are going to have if our prayers, for example, are not answered as quickly as we would like to be. Know that in the tough times, our characters are developed. And God often uses challenges, problems, trials to bring to light impurities in our characters or areas where we need to improve. Don't you think so? Minerva and I have been married how many years? 17? And in the early years of our marriage, it was tough adjusting to each other. We were in the mid-40s and when we got married and we have a blended family. She has two, I've got two. And uh, we were kind of set in our ways, so that was a challenge. Three weeks ago, you heard Minerva talk about love, right? And I don't want to brag about her, but in our early years of marriage, she taught me the real biblical meaning or definition of what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind, not easily angered, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And during those early years, I will go to God and complain, God, when are you going to change her? <laughs> Lord, I get up. And I've discovered and I've learned that God was more interested in changing me. The, he was using the challenges. He was using Minerva to bring to light impurities in me. And God was just using those problems as a mirror to recognize my weaknesses my shortcomings and learn to deal with it and make some adjustments and change. In other words, God was working something out of me so that I can rise to a new level and be the person, the husband that he would really want me to be. Amen? My friends, God may use people and situations in your life to help you better see yourself. Your husband, your wife, your in-laws, your children, your parents, your friends, co-workers, ministry co-workers. <laughs> they may be unwitting mirrors that God uses to reveal areas where we need to change. Amen? So my question to you today is, have you considered that God 
may want to change you? Perhaps he may be trying to teach you how to love your enemies. I don't know. Every trial, every challenge that comes into our lives has a divine purpose. The scripture says in James 1, let's read that. Uh, James 1, 2 to 4. James 1, 2 to 4, the slide number 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish it wor its work, so that it may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. So, we can see that God allows trials in our lives for a divine purpose. That's exactly what this verse is saying. Right? There is no such thing as accidents in the kingdom of God. So, as our first point of discussion today, God will allow trials, adversities in our lives for a divine purpose. Amen? Second point. Uh, let's go to the, there's a story in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 30. I'm not gonna, going to read the whole chapter because it's kind of long but let me just summarize the story about King David uh, before he became king of Israel one day he told his men that they're going to go out patrol uh, move go to another city and just patrol there and when while they were gone some bandits the Amalekites attacked their city burned down all the homes, stole their possessions, kidnapped their wives, the women, and children. So when David and his men returned, they were devastated. Why? Because of what happened. Their city was attacked, kidnapped their children, their wives, burned their homes, stole their possessions. So uh, to cut the story short, the people were blaming uh, David and they were planning to stone him. They got mad at David and we can read that on verse 6 of First Samuel 30 verse 6. Now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of the all people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. So, what did David do when he was distressed, he was devastated, not only him, but all the people because of what happened? So, what did David do? Instead of mourning, instead of having a pity party, feeling sorry, David went to the Lord. The Bible says, and encourage and strengthen himself in the Lord his God. In other words, he sought for comfort. He sought for uh, strength. He sought for instruction. What to do. Wisdom. What to do. So, instead of mourning, instead of having a uh, feeling sorry, having a pity party, he encouraged himself and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. We have a relationship with God. So, uh, just like the Bible says, we will all face difficulties, trials, adversities. And when we are in that situation, we can learn how to strengthen ourselves. How? By going to our God. Seek Him. Ask Him for instruction or comfort or strength, wisdom, what to do. That's what David did. So David inquired of the Lord in verse 8. 
So David inquired of the Lord saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue! That was a word of instruction. Pursue! For you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. He gave, the Lord gave David a word of instruction. At the same time, God assured him, it's going to, you're going to win. You're going to recover without fail. That was a blessed assurance from God, from his God. So David and his men followed the instruction of the Lord. And as David and his men persevered, God supernaturally, supernaturally helped them recover everything that had been stolen. We can uh, see that in verse 18. So David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. Amen? So what's our takeaway here? Are you... Let's say you're going through some challenges, some problems, some adversities. Or perhaps you are in the midst of making a major decision in your life. Perhaps a, a business decision. Maybe a career change decision. Or maybe you're going to get married. Will I marry this man? It's important to listen to the Word of God when you are going through some difficulties or in the midst of making a major decision. Encourage yourself. Strengthen yourself, yourself in the Lord, your God. He is your God. And you can talk to Him anytime. He's just waiting for you. Seek His instruction what to do. As you face the trial head on. And have faith in God that He will help you. Or perhaps as I've said, or you're in about to make a major decision. I know here at Symposia, we're about to make a something, a, a big decision. It's not, uh, you know, everyone knows that we're planning to go to a bigger place. And in Isaiah, uh, there's a word from the Lord that God has been impressing in my heart. Uh, Jamel, do you have that in Isaiah 54 too? Maybe we can consider this. God says, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Strengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. Do not be afraid. You will not suffer shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. Isn't that a word of instruction or a word of assurance from our God? Think about that. Or perhaps you may have a question today. You're facing a trial brought about by your own making, perhaps you made a boo-boo, a bad choice or an, an, an unwise decision. And because of that, you're facing this trial as a consequence. You're going through this trouble, both about this uh, bad choice that you made. And the question may come up to you, will God still help me? In this trouble that I'm facing because of my own making. 
Maybe you've wondered this question yourself, or maybe you haven't even bothered to ask. First of all, let's see what Romans 3.23 says. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 Everybody makes mistakes. Everyone has failed God in some way. That's what the Bible says. And you don't have to be a Bible scholar to know that. You know that yourself. You know that you have fallen short in some way to God, right? But I want to show you something beautiful about Jesus. And I want you to see how He responds to your mistakes and your failures. The famous verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And don't stop there. Verse 17 is so important as well. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Jesus' job description from God is to save us. And the New Testament Greek word for save is so-so, S-O-Z-O, which means to heal, to restore, to deliver, to make us whole. In other words, it's not just limited to saving us from going to the lake of fire, but to save us, perhaps if we are facing some health issue, financial issue, or, mar or marital issue, relationship issue, whatever the issue is. Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, is available there to save us from that problem. Amen? Even though it is because you have made some bad choices. Just as Jesus loves you in the midst of your trouble, just as Jesus accepts you in the midst of your trouble, just as Jesus forgives you in the midst of your trouble, Jesus wants to help you in the midst of your trouble. Amen? Ephesians 2, verse 8, slide number 11. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The grace of God is simply defined as the unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor of God. And unmerited, unearned, undeserved means that you and I don't deserve it. We don't deserve to go to heaven because all of us have sinned. But because of His grace, His unmerited favor, we can go to heaven as we put our faith in Jesus. Amen? And in the same manner, if we are facing a problem brought about by our own making, just like brought about by our sinning, Jesus wants to save us. Remember verse 17 of John 3, John 3. He did not come to condemn you and I. He did not come to judge us. He did not come to criticize us, but to save us from that mess. No questions asked. Amen? The grace of God is never put off by our mistakes or offended by our shortcomings. If we have failed, made a mistake, we don't fall out of the grace of God. We fall into the grace of God. In other words, the grace of God is available to us 24-7 to restore us, to put us back on our feet. Amen? As again, I will emphasize the grace of God is simply defined as the unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor of God. 
And there is a powerful truth in God's word that explains the response of grace when we miss the mark. Slide 12, please. God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace become more abundant. In other words, where sin abounds, the grace of God superabounds. Amen? Jesus doesn't leave us when we fall short, when we sin. When we make a mistake, he doesn't say, you're on your own, buddy. You made this mess, go fix it on your own. The opposite is true. Jesus sends his grace flooding in to help you in your time of need. That's why in Hebrews 4.16, the next slide, please. The word of God tells us to come boldly to the throne of grace. That, while, that we may obtain mercy and grace to find in time of need. I know a lot of people, if they make a mistake, instead of coming to the Lord, they will shy away. Because they find, they, 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 perhaps they feel so guilty, so condemned. But the truth is, God is telling us, Come boldly to me. Whether you made a mistake or not, come boldly to me. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to help. I'm here to take care of that problem. That's why it's so important to know about the truth of God's words. Instead of focusing on our mistakes, on our mi failures, let's put, let's put our focus on our Savior, Jesus, His Word. Don't rehearse your mistakes, your faults, but receive His unmerited favor. Amen? And don't forget that because of the finished work of Jesus, today you are now the righteousness of God in Christ. And that is how God the Father sees you and I. Even though we still make mistakes as a Christian, we are now covered under the blood. We're covered by the blood of Jesus. No longer a sinner anymore, unworthy of His love, but you are deeply loved and highly favored. His grace superabounds in your time of trouble. So, no, let's know the word of God. Let's learn to encourage, strengthen ourselves in the Lord our God with His word, with His promises. Know who you are in Christ. Know your identity in Christ. That's very important in finding strength when we are facing some difficulties, when we are going through some uh, adversities. Amen? So that's the second point. Learn to encourage and strengthen yourself in the Lord your God. He is your Savior. We have a relationship now. You can talk to Him just as you are. Don't be shy about the mess, the mistakes that you've made. He has given you the assurance already. Come boldly to me. And expect some mercy and expect grace from me. Amen. I don't care how many times you made it, you made a boo boo. He will never leave you nor forsake you. That's how good our Savior Jesus is. Amen. The third point the Bible tells us in Zechariah 9, verse 12. On uh, slide number 15, uh, Jamil. Return to your fortress, your prisoners, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much. Zechariah 9, 12. 
I know today many people, when they go through problems, difficulties, trials, they go around defeated, discouraged. And I could understand that because I myself went through those things, but I've learned how to become a prisoner of hope. People will live in anger, resentment, bitterness, maybe because of some unfair things that happened to them. Perhaps they lost uh, a business deal, some injustice happened, all kinds of valid uh, reasons. But my friends, if someone mistreated you or done you wrong, instead of feeling sorry about yourself, let hope fill your heart. Know that God will bring you out with twice what you had before. The Bible says in 49.23 that those who hope in the Lord will not be disappointed. Will not be disappointed. That's His word, folks. That's His promise. That's His assurance. You will never be disappointed when you put our, your confidence in me when you put your trust in me, when you put your hope in me. But Brother Rene, you don't know what I've been going through. Yes, you are right. I may not know it, but God knows it. The scripture teaches us that, in the uh, next slide, please, that we shouldn't look at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are only temporary, but the things that are not seen through our eyes of faith are eternal. One translation says that things are, that are seen are subject to change. In other words, your health may not look good today, but that's subject to change. Your finances, your checkbook may look pretty dismal, but that's subject to change. Nothing may be going right in your life right now, but that's subject to change. Your child might not be behaving, but don't worry, mommy. Don't worry, daddy. Don't lose hope. Your child is subject to change. Maybe your boss at work is mistreating you or he's kind of rude, disrespectful. You can just smile and say, you're subject to change. But be careful, don't say it in, your, in his face. Or else your job might be subject to change. <laughs> Amen. In our early years of marriage with Minerva, I know what her prayer was. You know what it is? This was her prayer. This man that I married is subject to change. <laughs> Praise the Lord! <laughs> Up to now, I think that's a prayer. <laughs> Folks, I, if you want to see God restore what's been stolen from you, stay filled with hope. Because those who hope in the Lord will never be disappointed, the Bible says. So when you get up each morning, expect, expect change. Expect things to change. Expect good things to happen. So instead of saying, oh Lord, good, it's morning again. Instead of having that kind of attitude, good morning Lord. I can't wait to see what you're about to happen in my life. Amen? Get excited. Stay hopeful. We are serving a God who does amazing things, who does impossible things. Remember, one touch of God's favor in your life can turn your life around. One touch of God's favor in your life can turn your finances around. One touch of God's favor in your life can make that sick body whole. Can turn your business around, your family around, your marriage around, your ministry around. Amen? Let's be a prisoner of hope. Symposia, let's be a prisoner of hope. And my last point, 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you're facing a tough situation today, we need to develop a restoration mentality. Mentally encourage yourself, the Lord, that God is going to turn your situation around. Remind yourself that you're a victor, not a victim. Not just a survivor, but more than a conqueror. You know the story of Job, right? You've heard about that story. You've, you read that. Job was a, a, a good man who loved God and his heart was to do what's right. Yet in a few weeks time, he lost his business, his flocks and herds, his family, even his health. Thing, things could not get any worse for Job and I'm sure he was tempted to be uh, bitter. He could have said, God, it's not fair. I don't understand this, why it's happening to me. And his own wife told him, Job, curse God and die. But no, Job knew that God is a God of restoration. He knew God could turn any situation around and his attitude was, even if I die, I'm going to die trusting God. I'm going to die believing for the best. When it was all said and done, God not only turned Job's calamity around, he brought Job out with twice what he had before. He had twice as many cattle, twice as many sheep. He got his health back and God gave him a new family. So God restored double what the enemy had stolen. And amazingly, the scripture says in Job 42, 12, the latter part of Job's life was more blessed than the first part. Maybe today we have to be reminded that God wants the rest of our life to be more blessed than the first part. So today, despite what you're going through, or despite somebody treated, how somebody treated you, or no matter what your, the medical report you receive, or what your bank statement says, God is saying this morning, I want to make the rest of your life happier, healthier, and more fulfilled than you can ever imagine. God wants to bring you out to a flourishing finish. In other words, God is saying, your best is yet to come. Will you receive his word today? Amen. Amen. That's our sharing for today.